So first, I want to thank you, Tanya, for the invitation and to all the other speakers for taking away the main point that I wanted to make because I really showed up to say you can't depend on NSF or any of the funding agencies for long-term funding. I want to explain why and sort of address some of the issues that I can um, to the extent that it, it all has to be open and freely available information. So with that in mind, um, Tanya said this is a global audience. So I add this slide just to make sure everybody is aware of what NSF is. Um, it is an independent government agency founded in 1950 based on a premise that was articulated in a, in a document by Vannevar Bush, um, the and science the endless frontier. And NSF's mission as written there is to promote the progress of science, advance national health, prosperity and welfare and secure the national defense. We were founded on the argument that the US had a battlefield advantage because of basic science research that, that ended up being useful in the long run. So our plan to secure the national defense is to encourage basic research and to come up with new activities and advance the frontiers of science. That's what NSF's mission has been since day one. And I forgot to stop my, start my timer. So Sonia, sorry, Tanya. Um, but as we go forward, so NSF has this bias towards innovation and, and novelty. That's our mission. There are other agencies with more of a mission for sustained involvement in activities, but NSF really has a bias towards innovation. And we are set up with these research directorates across the top as shown. Um, I'm from the D Director for Biological Sciences. So the perspective that I'm gonna share and given the crowd, I think it's most appropriate is how bio handles support for sustainability of databases and cyber infrastructure in general. Um, most of which is housed in an org organizational sense in the division of biological infrastructure. So that's where I sit. And we are arranged around these three clusters, research resources, human resources, and one called centers, facilities, and additional research infrastructure. We say Safari because it's a little easier. Our scale of investment varies between these programs or clusters and the focus is a little bit different, but they're all about supporting the needs for all of the biological science community and the other divisions in bio. So we really are tasked with supporting whatever happens in each of the other divisions. Our portfolio is thus very broad. When you look at our structure, you can see how the programs relate. So in human resources cluster, there are things like postdoctoral fellowships and research experiences for undergrads. I'm gonna spend most of the time today talking about the programs that are in the research resources cluster. And we manage a foundation-wide program called major, major Research Instrumentation. That's mostly acquisition of new instruments, some development, but the rest of what's in this cluster are core programs around development of infrastructure, innovation, capacity, and sustaining. Um, the centers, I can answer questions about if we get to that, but those are basically larger, longer term investments like the National Ecological Observatory Network or NEON. So this color scheme is sort of meant to denote the distinction between the different programs that we have. There's one color for each program. So innovation, has different tracks for bioinformatics, instrumentation, or research methods. The capacity track has cyber infrastructure collections or field stations tracks. And sustaining really is for any of the critical resources, but it focuses almost exclusively on uh, cyber infrastructure resources with some limited support for, for living, living stocks. And, and one thing to highlight, we've in the last couple of years gone to a no deadline program so we're ready to accept proposals at any time um, and we'll manage the review as quickly as we can. But to highlight this mindset that NSF has for innovation, I just would emphasize that in the innovation program, it's got its own solicitation. Um, duration of the awards is usually three years. They expect to make 20 to 40 awards per year and have around $20 million of funds to invest each year in support of those new proposals that come in. And really it's designed to take ideas from conception to commissioning. Essentially, as soon as your new instrument is producing data you trust, you're probably done with the innovation program. You demonstrated proof of principle and developed a new capacity. From there, you would typically go into, and it has a bioinformatics track. So the description I just provided, if you have a new algorithm or a new method of analysis that will work better, 
10 times better than whatever's out there, for example, um, you could apply to this bioinformatics track. Once you've got proof of principle and a working prototype, then you're talking about adding features and hardening the resource. So then we're talking about capacity. And so that's support for implementation or scaling of, or major improvements to existing tools or resources. The capacity program is not where you go to invent something new, it's where you go to, to make something better. And again, with the emphasis on the available budget for this program, this is in the solicitation, it's in the neighborhood of $20 million a year and they expect to make 50 to 75 awards. That is probably a little high relative to the average award size that's publicly available, but it's, it's in the right idea that major investments are prepared for the innovation and capacity. And within the capacity track for this crowd, the cyber infra or capacity program cyber infrastructure track is really about a robust cyber infrastructure to enable transformative biological research. If people can't get at the data, they can't use it effectively. So we wanna make sure that the resources scale and that they have useful features that people can use um, to do important research. The priorities for the program are on essentially delivered useful products that people can use, that the community is engaged in essentially evaluating the resource and making sure it's used and useful and broadly adopted through the community. And so it, it's really about that hardening the infrastructure to make it more usable. The sustaining program, and I put the red box around the bad news at the bottom, um, we are really only anticipating one to three awards per year. And so with Chuck's comment about the proliferation of resources needing support, he's exactly right that um, it is a struggle to, to manage this program and figure out which resources can be supported against our much smaller budget and a very large community of, of resources that need that support. What we do is provide support for ongoing operations and maintenance of existing mature critical infrastructure. Those are our general criteria for relevance and, and competitiveness in the program. We do not support requests to do research or to add features to existing resources. The only two categories for allowable expenses in the sustaining program are operations and maintenance activities, ongoing day-to-day -day operations, to include human resources or capital as needed, or costs relevant to the implementation or development of policies and procedures that help you shift the cost burden onto users and stakeholder communities. So this is meant to send a signal to the community that the sustaining program, part of the sustaining plan is to help you transition from direct grant support for your resource, as all the other speakers have highlighted different avenues to, to bring in that essentially revenue. Our solicitation specific criteria focus on those criteria and, and really what evidence is available that this is a critical resource for the NSF bio funded community of researchers. NSF bio, for example, does not support research into the efficacy or development of pharmaceutical compounds with clinical intent. So that resource, no matter how awesome it is, wouldn't be competitive in our program because it doesn't align with our research priorities. The rest of the questions there go basically in the same vein to evaluate you, the relevance, utility, feasibility, and scalability. Are you ready to serve the community? And this last one is important. We ask reviewers to help us figure out whether the resources and projects have planned for your long and short-term fiscal health to make it worth investing in it long-term. So, as suggestions, and I'm limited to what I can be directive about here, but these ones that I can say, for attribution, budget, and your roles as PIs and reviewers, make sure that you and your users know the importance of mentioning and attributing the importance of your resource because we check. We look in public databases for mentions and publications as examples, um, and we can increasingly check in annual reports and proposal content for what comes into NSF. That's really important in how we make our decisions. The other would be budget for support. Direct support for a given resource from NSF may taper off, but user fees and, for example, charges relevant to the publication, documentation, or dissemination of data 
are allowable charges and they're highlighted in BIOS guidance for data management plans that where there are such charges, you should budget for it accordingly. And that practice aligns the resource support with the agencies or communities that use it the most. So their grants can pay to help support yours indirectly through user fees, but only if you charge them. The other option is to value and be valued for your contributions to different projects. And G2 and G5 and our budgets are the sub, our, our contracts and sub awards lines in the budget. So if you're providing a service, you are helping their feasibility arguments for execution of their proposal plans, and you're adding value to their proposal. You should be recognized for that, literally, for and value your own time and effort. Um, it helps add credibility and it addresses feasibility concerns. So, so don't leave that out. Lots of other communities and plumbers and lawyers come to mind have figured out essentially billable hours, and it's really the same kind of mindset. Value your contributions. And then as a PI, make sure you budget accordingly. And when you're a reviewer, demand that other people do that in their data management plans. So if somebody has a plan to produce a bunch of data and says they'll dump it on one of your resources, but they don't have a budget for that, they don't have a viable plan, make sure you rank the proposal accordingly or raise that concern. Uh, and finally, if you have um, questions, talk to your program officers. We really do like to help. This is more fun than doing anything bureaucratic. So we like to talk shop with PIs. Um, please do reach out and email us. One thing that I wanna highlight is the sustaining program is one option, but it's small. There are other options at NSF and how do you find them? The best way is to search our awards database. I just searched for data and infrastructure. There were one minute. Thank you. 208 program elements for 482 awards active at NSF right now. And you can look, it spans all seven directorates at NSF and scales from 50,000 to well over a million. So use this data. You can download it in Excel format or whatever you prefer, XML or CVS and CSV. Use the data to find programs, um, or you can search for funding opportunities and enter on your own search keywords to get active funding opportunities. And I'm too lazy to do either of those on a regular basis. So I signed up for regular email updates so that funding opportunities get delivered into your inbox at whatever frequency you choose. You can set it up for a weekly delivery on a Sunday morning.